housekeeping items. Um, so attendee lines are automatically muted. Um, this session is being recorded and the slides and recordings will be available after the summit. We ask that you please use the chat to ask any questions. We will also be providing a post-session survey at the end of today's session for those requesting professional development credits for um, at the end of, for those requesting professional development credits for attending today's session, you will need to complete the post survey. We will also be raffling gift cards after the summit ends. So in order to enter this raffle, you will need to complete a post, post, post survey as well. Now I'm excited to, do, to introduce you to our wonderful speakers for today. Leading the session, we have Sonia Fernandez Arana, who is a community nutrition advisor for Dairy Council of California. We, we also have Janice Price, who is a project specialist in the Student Achievement and Wellness Unit in the Educational Services Department at the Orange County Department of Education. We also have Ann Gaffney, who is a nutrition specialist for the Elk Grove Unified School District. Lastly, we have Andrea Guerin, who is the Director of Health and Wellness at the Redwood City School District. Welcome, speakers. Now I'm going to hand it off to Janice Price. Hello, everybody. We are, there we go. We are going to be um, talking to you today really about how do we talk about policies and frameworks, really big ideas and initiatives, programming. How can we use that to promote nutrition education and the health of our students at the in implementation phase? And so we have quite the speakers for you today. We're very excited. Yes, thank you for the, the names now that can go with the faces of how we were introduced. Um, for what we're going to be um, focusing on today, you can see our objectives for this session that we're going to be looking at that high level overview of what does the new health framework have in it that will help promote nutrition education. If we have standards and a framework, then you should be teaching health nutrition education. We're going to recognize the roles that nutrition has when it comes to um, the multi-level approaches to whole health. We're gonna identify resources and tools to support the coordination and delivery of comprehensive health education. Um, we have a website for you that we're gonna share. And we're gonna spotlight um, definitely two school districts, Elk Grove Unified and Redwood City, who both have been very influential in positive practices and outcomes with their students. So that's gonna be our um, flow for today. And I get to help start talking to you about um, how students need to be healthy to learn, but students also too need to be need to learn how to be healthy. How many of you would agree with that? Read it one more time. Students need to be healthy to learn, but they also too need to learn how to be healthy. It's a chicken or the egg, which one comes before the other. Either way, we need both. So how do we use frameworks, resources, and tools to help make this happen in schools. And I know that there's been a lot of conversation about um, MTSS, multiple uh, tiers, systems of support. That's gonna be on the next slide. This is a great visual of what is needed, the framework that we use in schools. Now, you might be a community agency. I'd really would like you to still understand MTSS because you play a role in this. Maybe your food service, you play a role in this also you are part of the multiple tier systems of supports with our students in our schools. So let me explain this a little bit. It's a great visual for a huge framework that basically talks about how if we provide services to all students, you see that at the top, and some of our services are really targeted to some of our students, and then we have services that are targeted to just a couple of our students. If we do that well, we will help all students at our schools. So if we think about nutrition education, do we want that to happen with all of our students? Some of our students or a few. 
most cases, you're probably all thinking all students need nutrition education. Some adults need nutrition education still or health education. So this is where when we want to promote teaching about nutrition and health and wellness in general, we need to use the terms of universal supports for all students. That is where health education falls into play. Then through that course, right, a, a nutrition class, you might hear a student say, I am starving, I didn't eat breakfast, I need more food. Then that connects us to a tier two service where we can say to that student or connect them to getting um, meals at school or maybe like a, a food service program outside of school, right? Then a few students might actually need counseling when it comes to nutrition education. See how that flows, that we are providing tiered supports for all of our students. But again, that argument, if we don't have a universal system in place or a universal support for all of our students, like health education, where nutrition is taught, if we don't have that, how are we providing services to all of our students? In most cases, we are only providing tier two services and tier three. So this is where you can use a framework to really promote what is um, a universal support. Let's go to the next slide when we look at how this fits together with whole school, whole child model, that connections with all of these blue sectors in this, in this image, is really providing services to all of our students, right? If you start at the top, you see health education. A student needs health education to be a, for us to be able to be educating the whole child. They also too need, see to the right, it will say physical education and physical activity, nutrition services and activities is in there, health services like our nurses, counseling, social emotional climate needs to be considered. And we go all the way around to those blue segments to really educate the whole child and give them those services. This model has been around. It's a combination um, prepared from the Center for Diseases and Control, CDC, as well as the school's um, ASCD has come up with this theory, a framework, a model of what we need to be doing in schools. So again, coming at the lens that you're at, where do you fit in here that you could be a part of students' health and wellness on the campus? Because if you talk this language that we have in schools of MTSS, whole school, whole child, it will be a better fit. You will be a perfect fit in the puzzle of matching the frameworks and the, the words and the theories, like I said too, of what is happening in schools. So we wanted to give you that big idea, right? The big idea of how do you fit in schools? Now we're gonna talk really quickly about that one section that says health education, because, um, in California, we have health standards, and we now have a new health framework that helps us teach these standards. So when we talk about nutrition education, health education, we want to be talking again in the, the mindset of an educator in schools and referencing the standards that have been written. There's no deviation from that. When we are in schools, everything comes down to, are you teaching the standards and how are you assessing them? So we really want to use that terminology. So I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes explaining to you what health education looks like, how do you use these tools that have been created. So let's start with understanding health education has six main content areas. I don't know about you, but think about your health ed class that you might've had. Health probably might be a little different now than when it was back then. A lot of times it, it's a coach teaching. And so they really focus on, you know, looking at videos of crashes that have happened and how you're not supposed to drink and drive. Um, they probably uh, needed a little nuance. So we have spent a lot of time really helping understand the six content areas that should be taught in health education. So you'll notice, right, the great image with the apple and the person running, that's gonna be nutrition and physical activity. Growth development and sexual health is another large content area. Injury prevention and safety. 
Why that content area? With our youth, that's a leading cause of death is accidents. So we need to make sure our students know about injury prevention and safety. And that's beyond wearing a helmet. When they get into middle and high school, we're really even talking about healthy relationships, human trafficking, and all of those uh, nuances of, uh, of our society that we really want our students to know how to make healthy decisions about. We also to bring in alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, mental and emotional social health, which we know is so important. People are saying we need to be doing it. If you teach health, you are teaching mental and emotional health. So we want to really encourage that. And then personal and community health too, which is going to be thinking about how are we affecting our community? Everything from, are we um, staying clean and healthy ourselves? Are we getting doctor visits and maybe talking about immunizations? Um, or are we recycling and things like that? So if we go to the next slide, I want to show you how much health education, if you teach it all together, we call it comprehensive health education. If you do that, and I'm especially talking about administrators, if we could go back a little bit, Sonia, uh, if we teach comprehensive health education, we actually will meet all of these mandates that schools need to be doing. A lot of times they're sideload or pocketed, like only the PE teachers teach about nutrition and physical activity, and only the science teachers teach about individual growth and development. We don't want that model. We want health educators that teach comprehensive health this way. But I am going to head back into the nutrition realm of nutrition and wellness that if you look at nutrition and physical activity, that content area, what law do we have there? The Healthy Hunger Free Acts 2010 that was written. That is where your district wellness policy is implemented. And in that wellness policy is where you should have it written of how much nutrition education happens in your district. Many people say we shall teach nutrition. Quality wellness policies will say we will teach three to five lessons a year in certain grade levels, right? That is where you get the teeth to a policy to implement. So if you don't know what your, pol your district wellness policy is, we hope that after this session that you will um, understand the need and have that desire to go in and take a look at it. And do not hesitate in updating. Every three years, that wellness policy should be updated. I could go on and on about all the other ones, but let's just talk about many of you might be thinking, well, how often should health be taught? Who should be teaching health? Which is the next slide, Sonia, we're good. So if you are in elementary school, know that there is ed code that health is considered the same as math and science and language arts. All of these content areas that you see on this screen are your required content areas. Now, how it's being done is always the very interesting part. Many times, right, what content areas get focused on is what gets tested. So some fall through the crack. Um, health is one of those. But know that you have ed code backing you when you say, I want to teach more health in my school. You have ed code that says it should be done. That's at the elementary level. If we go to the next slide, because we know middle and high always have a little bit different ed code, which should be, know that it is also required for all of your students to receive health education. Very, very controlled at the local level of how that happens. Many of you might be saying, okay, well, I imagine they probably teach health in elementary school, but we don't have anything in middle and we might have a semester in, in high school, but I really don't know. That's because it comes down to a very local decision. So this is why we're really trying to help advocate for health education and giving you the tools for how to do that. Okay, because many times, like we're saying, it's getting, it's getting pushed down on the priorities. But as we know, like we said, right? You have to be healthy to learn, but we have to teach our students how to be healthy. That doesn't happen just on its own. So this next slide is fantastic for you to use to advocate for health education. Many people think that it's overwhelming to think about adding a content area, but we wanna show you this chart of how the standards are written. The fact that not every grade level does all six content areas. So it's, this is like an interactive chart, perfect, Sonia. So imagine you're a fourth grade teacher who should be teaching nutrition education? 
A fourth grader teacher is going to teach new has standards to teach nutrition in fourth grade. Also, they're going to focus on injury prevention and then alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Those are the three content areas that a fourth grader would do. And they're hoping, right, that if you go to fifth grade, you could see where those content areas start adding in. Now, of course, there's much more standards in middle school and high school because the intention, the ed code is written that the intention is you would have at least a semester in middle school and a semester in high school to teach health education. So there are standards in all of those content areas. So this is a great chart. I really recommend you referencing it. Now, what you're going to find with the health literacy model is helping you understand that health is not just about teaching facts. How many of you know broccoli's healthy? It's good for you. Hopefully everybody, right? When was the last time you ate the broccoli? What's better for you, broccoli or brownies? What's better for you to sit and watch a Netflix blend or maybe go for a 30 minute walk? Okay, we all know the facts. And that's what we're finding in health education. It is not difficult to find health facts. What we need to do is teach them skills, right? And that's where you're gonna see every single skill that's listed above is what do you need to do to put those facts into a positive, healthy behavior? Do you need to understand the influences that you have in your life? Maybe broccoli is not easily accessible in your house. And so you need to figure out how do I ask for it or who has influence over the food in my home? Maybe you need to learn about accessing valid information. Do I go to google.com to get my health information about broccoli or do I need to go to a positive, a, a very, research validated and reliable website to get a nutrition label around broccoli, right? That's a skill, you need to know how to do that. That's what health education is about, teaching skills. We go on and on, decision-making, goal-setting, practicing health-enhancing behaviors, using uh, a goal-setting tracking sheet, and now I'm at practicing healthy behaviors. And then at the end, it's health promotion. It's, I've got this down, I know how to eat healthy, and I'm ready to get other people on board with eating healthy with me. And that's exactly the goals of health education. When you get to that health promotion, you have a student that has very high health literacy. And that's what the framework is all about. If we could go to the next slide, because as a teacher, we want to teach the facts. That's easy to go into. We, 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 we really have, uh, that's the skill set that we've been giving us teachers is how do I teach them the data? It's nuanced. It's a very new thing for teachers to build in the skills part. That's difficult too. Have you ever tried to have a role play with students? You need to do a lot of setting the stage, giving them examples, giving them a chance to practice, right? Let's go to the next slide. So the framework provides an excellent opportunity for teachers to build their confidence in how do I teach especially skills. So what we did over here on this slide is we're showing you this is what a, skill, a standard is in the standard document that you should be doing. Like you're going to analyze the, this isn't about nutrition, but maybe it's injury prevention and safety. And the standard is that students are going to analyze the sources of information regarding injury prevention and safety. So you're going to analyze sources and figure out, is this pamphlet or is this ad talking about how my new skateboard is going to make me never fall down? Is that a good is that a good source? You're going to analyze that, right? So how do you have them do that in the framework is going to tell you how to do that. So this is an example. A teacher can create um, and give an assignment of safety video vignettes that the students can make that help them show that they know how to analyze influences. This is fantastic. This is where the shift needs to happen in health education. And imagine how many examples we can use when it comes to nutrition education that are going to be in there. That's perfect, Sonia. If you want to go ahead and go, because some of you, this might be very, very new, the health education framework. I'm going to put the link in the chat in a little bit. Um, or Sonia, if you can do that too, because it is a PDF, it is available. These are the chapters that you have available, um, the way that it's written. So you'll notice there's a lot of background information, but when you look at chapters four through six, that's where you're going to get those detailed examples like you just read about, oh, create a safety video or do this teacher, create this assignment. All those examples are going to be in there. Now, what I'd like to do, the next slide is going to really highlight and give you the website, CaliforniaHealthEducation.org. You're going to want to visit this website. Now, I want to highlight, I, I have only five more minutes to go with you. So, um, 
really highlight the tabs that are across the top. If you are an educator, um, if you want to open up the website, Sonia, and then maybe you can navigate the website a little bit too to show um, what is available. Uh, because even if you're a community agency and you're doing health education, are you matching the standards? And if you can't answer that confidently, then I really suggest you going to this website and checking out some sources like educator tab. Maybe you produ produce lessons that are grade seven and eight through eight. And you want to look at here, well, you'll notice when you scroll through, the first thing that you're going to see, uh, we can, the, the California Healthy Kids Resource Center is a great lending library, but let's focus on content areas. Maybe you need to check in, um, is my content really matching what is recommended in the framework? So you can look through the content areas to do a double check there. We have resources there, but, but um, if you were to go to nutrition, physical activity, this is a background information that teachers might want to make sure that they know about first. And then as you scroll down, Sonia, you're going to see curriculum, which guess what we might be referencing. Definitely Dairy Council, Nourish is a wonderful curriculum as well. These are all free curriculums. If you maybe you're a community agency and you want to compare your products or be listed here too, let us know. This does, um, you know, is meant to be across all of California, all of California, because we reference California standards. And then I love this part too of the framework. It helps us think about as a teacher, how do I partner with my family around nutrition in middle school? How do I partner with my school? And how do I partner with my community? Because we know that with that partnership, you get the whole school, whole school, whole child, whole community aspect of it, right? If you were to go back up a little bit though, Sonia, um, we are really focusing here on the content. But if you go back up to the top, I wanna show you the resources for a teacher. So go back to educator and then grade seven and eight, and instead of hitting a content area, scroll past that. Exactly. And now we're going to get into some guides. And I really would like us to focus on these or you to spend some time after the conference and take a look at these guides that have steps and cues for how to teach skills. This is very, very important and needed for teachers. Um, and then here, these are going to be poster size uh, examples of how to teach skills. You can put that up in your classroom when you're doing that. Uh, many times we say, go make a healthy decision. And students are like, well, I thought it was healthy. Like looking back on it, I, I don't know how I made that decision. But having these steps and cues to follow are very, very helpful. So these are definitely tools that you're going to want to go back and look at. Standard guides and the standard posters about the new health framework to help promote. If we could go all the way back up to the top, um, we're going to do the other, other tabs. If you're an administrator, um, we don't have to touch on anything, but I'd like you to just see the topics that are available. Maybe you want to know how to promote health education or um, specifically, you know, connecting mental health with nutrition and physical activity and helping our students understand about, um, you know, our biases and, and access and accessibility. We have created tons of tools for you here to look at. And then yes, we have a family and um, community tab as well to have resources, how to talk to your students about things. Um, where can I go get resources about health and nutrition too? So definitely a website you're going to want to go back and visit. As we head back to the presentation um, and the final slides that I have, because again, I went from big picture of frameworks and how to use the terminology in schools to California standards and our framework for health education. Um, and before I leave you to go into Sonia's talking, gonna talk about specific curriculum that you can use, I'd like you to leave in the chat. So we're gonna go to the next slide. And this is the question, how could these free tools, the website and help enhance wellness of the whole child um, in your school or district. I'd love for you to put that in the chat um, for us to kind of have an ending of this section before we go into the next one of curriculum and hearing of examples of what this looks like implemented. So take some time to, to gather your thoughts. How could these free tools help you enhance wellness of the whole child? And we have a question in the chat um, from Tina Borgman. Tina asks, will these resources be emailed out? I'm on my phone today. 
I think we can definitely share the presentation. Um, maybe through the Health Council, they could share our presentation with those that have registered. And just remember the website, californiahealtheducation.org. That's where you can get everything that I just talked about when it comes to um, standards and the framework and the tools. Great. And I'm just gonna look at the chat here. Anybody, people are saying, um, that they are thinking about having more workshops for parents and bringing parents in these conversations. Absolutely. And that's one of the benefits of health education. It is not a school alone conversation. You know, the school should not be teaching everything about health to a child. And parents need a lot of help. They probably, you know, uh, are lacking some of that background knowledge that, you know, the average person just isn't specialized in. But imagine the partnership when you come together and help students with health and wellness together. That's what health education is all about. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave. Um, uh, we're kind of just to move on with the time, but the final slide is my contact information there too. So if you would need anything more, um, OCDE uh, works across all of California. We even do federal. If you want us to help come out and do any presentations or collaborations, we'd love to do that too. Anything I can do to help promote um, my, my personal uh, favorites of health education, I'd love to do that. So thank you so much for having me here today. And um, I'll hand it over to Sonia to do the next part of our presentation. Thank you so much, Janice, for just you know providing a great overview of that you know the new health ed framework and sharing those wonderful tools and resources that you know all of us, all members here in the audience, we can tap into to enhance school wellness and you know comprehensive health education. So now I'd like us to sort of start discussing nutrition, um, you know, and its role and its really strategy as that multi-level approach to whole health, um, as Janice shared earlier that whole school, whole community, whole child framework really shows how multiple aspects of the school environment support students' health and well-being and that academic success. You know, the environment has become much more holistic in its approach to education um, and really supporting, you know, the whole child aims for those collaboration to really happen across sectors. We want to be able to support every child's cognitive, physical, social, and emotional development and when it comes to nutrition, establishing those healthy eating habits early during childhood, we know it's so much more easier and more effective than trying to change, you know, behaviors during adulthood. Um, so therefore, you know, schools play a critical role in promoting the health of, you know, young people and, you know, establishing those lifelong healthy behaviors. And research has demonstrated that, you know, healthy eating has been linked in studies to improve learning outcomes and you know, ensure that students are able to reach their fullest potential. Yeah, I can't. So if we can um, maybe mute ourselves, thank you so much. Um, Janice briefly, you know, mentioned this, really local school wellness policies, right? Those are an important tool for creating those healthy school environments and promoting school wellness, but also serves as a preventative tool to help reduce that childhood obesity and you know, providing assurance that our school you know, meal nutrition guidelines meet those federal standards. Um, Janice briefly touched on the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010, as she shared it's a legislative mandate that includes the content areas of nutrition and, and physical activity, and you know, basically all local educational agencies, so our school districts that participate in a federal child nutrition program, um, like school lunch and school breakfast are required by law to, you know, have a wellness policy. And as she shared, you know, health education, it's so critical in building those knowledge and those skills to instill those lifelong habits um, and health literacy. And to further connect the health and framework in supporting wellness policy, you know, the framework echoes and addresses the constructs of WISC, you know, like nutrition, physical activity, mental, social, emotional health, uh, but it also addresses community involvement and that support in learning and health outcomes of healthy, you know, kids to be healthy, safe, engaged, and supported through, you know, coordination, policy, and those, you know, processes and practices. And we all have a strategic opportunity to update our policies, you know, with supportive language to reflect the ongoing commitment that we all have to school wellness. Um, and, you know, USDA, the final rule, does to, you know, share that, you know, districts have to do that comprehensive assessment of their policy, as Janice said, you know, every three years, and that is called the triannual assessment. So this is a good opportunity for stakeholders 
and members of the school community um, to come together during that you know, comprehensive assessment process and evaluate policy and kind of look more for you know, inclusive language um, and create health goals and action plans you know, every year to help integrate systems of support when implementing those instructional you know, programs and health strategies. Um, so I'm hoping that this tool here uh, could really serve um, of tremendous value to you know, everyone um, that's with us today. The California Local School Wellness Policy Collaborative developed um, you know, the, a wonderful tool that's been approved by you know, California Department of Education to support the triangle assessment process. These are great templates that districts and community partners can access. Um, they're easy kind of four part templates that can you know, be integrated. They have great boilerplate languages and checklists and report templates um, that could be tailored to your need. So the website is here available for you, for you to kind of check out those templates um, and you know, have a little bit more coordinated conversation uh, with your you know, um, wellness advisory committee. But shifting gears a little bit from you know, the health education framework to wellness policy, to now I want us to start discuss the impacts of adverse childhood experiences on education and health. And research has shown that you know, children with ACEs you know, that struggle um, you know, have, you know, have challenges learning and participating in school. The likelihood of them dropping out um, early is high and then not really pursuing a higher education. And in a report that was shared by the California Surgeon General on adverse childhood experiences, toxic stress in health really stated that, you know, we, we have to listen and we really have to pay attention to that evidence that is telling us that cumulative adversity, particularly when experienced early in life, is the root cause of, you know, some of the most detrimental, longest lasting and costly health challenges facing our state and our nation. Um, and in California, sadly, more than six out of 10 individuals have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. And poverty and food insecurity are indicators of ACEs. So research is telling us that that adversity experience as a child can affect you know, their stress response functions, leading to long-term changes in their brain and in their bodies um, you know, that may result in health problems later on into adulthood. And experiencing four or more ACEs is associated with an increased risk for you know, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes. So we, you know, we have the science and the understanding about toxic stress and the response that it has as a you know, key biological mechanism by which you know, it leads to those negative health outcomes. And you know, this is a public health crisis that you know, is really calling for all of us to adopt these evidence-based you know, buffering intervention techniques and strategies. Um, and that, you know, the research is telling us that sleep, exercise, nutrition, uh, mindfulness, and, uh, you know, creating a nurturing environment help to reduce those stress hormones and enhance the ability of the brain to recover from stress. And when we start to think about the whole child, you know, how can we support our kids and help them develop those buffering techniques? And one way um, is, you know, you can elevate nutrition education as a foundation or that catalyst to build and reinforce those social emotional skills so that you know kids have the knowledge and the confidence to adopt a wide range of healthy behaviors you know like making good food choices practicing mindfulness getting good sleep and exercising um, and you know as i shared nutrition is that foundation and that building block for supporting proper growth, growth and development in our kids so although all nutrients are really key and necessary um, there are really particular ones that support neural development and that, you know, really help to, um, you know, propel that optimal development in our kids. Um, and those are really the ones that are particularly highlighted. Um, and these are really essential during, you know, early childhood and school age kids, we know that they need a variety of nutrients um, and those nutrient rich foods to meet their growing needs. And, you know, despite nutrients from, you know, under, cons under consumed foods like you know, vegetables, you know, uh, fruits, dairy, and whole grains, nearly one third of our children and adolescents are either classified as overweight or obese. So the prevalence requires, you know, attention and those intervention strategies and nutrition education and access to those nutritious foods. It's so important to addressing, you know, health equity and, you know, supporting the whole child. And the benefits of school meals certainly, you know, are beyond just the nutritional intake, right? Those studies are telling us that the proper nourishment really helps to 
make sure that kids are prepared and ready to succeed at, you know, in the classroom and at school. Their behavior and their cognitive development is improved. Um, you know, they have good test scores, reduce absenteeism, um, et cetera. And Janice um, touched on this, but I want to emphasize here that nutrition education, it's a continuum of learning experiences to develop knowledge and skills that become, you know, lifelong healthy practices. And it's through that consistent integration from early, you know, early in life through, you know, 12th grade and even beyond, right, into adulthood that that, that standard-based instruction in schools really teaches that physical, that academic, that mental, and that social emotional benefits of you know physical activity and how nutrition impacts one short-term and long-term personal health. And kind of going on the vein of social emotional, um, you know, the, the importance for that. We know people with strong social emotional skills are just much better to cope with you know, everyday challenges and benefit you know, academically, socially, and professionally later in life. And for students, that positive relationship and emotional connections really play a critical role in their learning process. And the California Department of Education is committed to helping you know, our educators infuse you know, SEL into every you know, child's school experience. And SEL, nutrition, and nutrition education can integrate through instruction and activities to reinforce those you know, similar skills for both those kind of you know, health education content areas. And food and nutrition um, and those you know, nutrition activities, they already have you know, SEL built in them naturally. There are many ways that we can demonstrate how nutrition can help you know, kids develop those important social emotional skills. And you know, we'll definitely highlight that connectivity later in the presentation. Um, and what I'm projecting here is the, the California Social Emotional Learning Guidelines, these uh, principles, and it really demonstrates that continual importance for collaboration across sectors to address the needs of the whole child. Uh, and this is a spotlight on um, social emotional learning and nutrition, education, and physical activity um, that's highlighted within the health ed framework. And the framework really provides a you know, a wonderful sort of deep dive into the five um, core competencies and how those competencies are closely integrated with health ed um, and those sort of direct alignments um, with the, you know, health education content standards as well. Um, but when we start to kind of break down nutrition into this lens of social emotional learning, you know, eating is something, you know, we have to do every day, right, in order to survive and topics around food naturally bring people together. Um, you know, it invites the practice and the behaviors, you know, that show respect, the appreciation and inclusivity of, you know, people with different cultures, backgrounds, um, et cetera, within their kind of, you know, their, their school community or their home community. And, you know, how we eat, um, you know, are we eating alone? Are we eating with friends or family? All that really, you know, um, touches on, you know, how we're building you know, just the, the, the positive relationship skills. And we know that when we're feeling stressed or uh, we're emotional or we're rushed, we often, you know, don't make the best, you know, food decisions and food choices. So that impacts the quantity and the quality of foods we eat. Um, and the, that nutrition that fuels that development of the brain as we shared. And that's really, at, you know, the start and lays that foundation for those cognitive abilities. Um, and we know with a lot of our kiddos, if they're just not well nourished um, or they're not, you know, eating enough, you know, nutrient rich foods, you know, that's going to lead to a decrease in energy and mood. And that's going to impact their concentration and how they feel throughout the day. Um, and we all have heard the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And this really can be said for education. And when a community rallies around a child, they can build a robust and supportive system around them. And it's our collective responsibilities to really come together and support the various facets of a child's life. And as Jenna shared, um, you know, the MTSS, so the multi-tiered systems of support and the WISC framework really call for that unification of education, community leaders and families to come together and to collaborate to improve student health outcomes. And developing partnerships with community agencies is critical, um, and it should be recognized for the difference they make in improving, you know, those opportunities for kids and creating those experiences uh, that have a long-standing impact on their education, their development, and their health. 
Um, so certainly community groups like, you know, Dairy Council of California and, you know, our wonderful summit organizers, Health Education Council, you know, we all can provide unique services and programs that align to support the needs of students and, you know, their families. So with Dairy Council, we invite that multidisciplinary collaboration and coordination and co-creation to really champion community health um, by teaching and inspiring healthy eating habits and advocating for you know, making healthy, wholesome food accessible um, and affordable to all. Um, and to give just a little bit of brief background, if you're like, I've never heard of Dairy Council, who are you guys? So we are a quasi-state agency that's been supporting community health through nutrition education for over a hundred years. And, you know, we remain committed to our cause, which is to elevate the health of children and families to the pursuit of lifelong healthy eating habits. Um, it's a mouthful <laughs> to say that in a quick sentence. Um, but, uh, you know, we recently launched um, the Let's Eat Healthy movement. And this movement really allows us to activate our cause and to do so much more through the partnerships that we are doing to ensure that all of our communities are supported and they grow healthfully. Um, and, you know, myself, as a representative for Dairy Council, I'm a community nutrition advisor. And, you know, my role is to kind of just, you know, move beyond just placing, you know, resources itself in the environment. It's to provide that technical advising and that guidance to help, you know, really, you know, uh, implement policy and create, you know, supportive systems and environments that promote health and wellness. And in the next couple of slides, I'll certainly kind of just walk through some of those resources that we have, um, you know, that, you know, our schools and our community leaders here can, you know, can access and, you know, to support their planning or their development and, you know, integration of um, nutrition health programs. But I want to share um, briefly this, you know, this slide here. Um, this really shows the results of, you know, a survey that we conducted to um, K-12 educators to kind of measure the efficacy of our nutrition education um, resources. So these are evidence-based, they align to the dietary guidelines for Americans. And, you know, they're also aligned to California Common, um, common Core State Standards. And, you know, what teachers said that, you know, 98% reported that the content is valuable and it's relevant aligning to educational standards. And Janice had shared, you know, how, um, how important that is, right? Um, and we wanna make sure that that's clearly visible for, um, for our administrators and our teachers to see that, you know, connect alignments. Um, 95 said that, 95%, excuse me, said that lessons are developmentally appropriate. Um, and that 88 reported students were engaged through the nutrition lesson activity. So all of our services and resources available at Dairy Council um, are, you know, at no cost to our California-based educators, health professionals, and community leaders and members. So the fun stuff, um, right? Like what are these resources exactly? Um, and you know, our nutrition and resources, like our curricula, our online lessons and videos, they all teach a food group, you know, sort of framework that really empowers kids to make those, you know, good food choices, enabling them to be those decision makers, you know, for their own health and well-being. And topics like healthy snacking and breakfast, these are all, you know, daily teachable moments um, for kids to practice self-management and responsible decision making. And, you know, within our lessons, we try to reinforce activities like food tastings, you know, and learning about the food systems and encouraging school gardens, you know, all these offer opportunities for that hands-on exploration and that tasting really allows kids to right, have those experiences, you know, describe foods with all their senses while they're building self-awareness. And, you know, the, the school gardens, they allow for that discussion for, you know, food sources, that seasonality and, you know, cultural food preparations as well, um, which all build social awareness and, you know, relationship skills. Um, and programs like our uh, mobile dairy classroom program, those farm to you programs, they all teach kids about right where their food comes from and increases um, that appreciation for the journey of food from the farm to their plate um, and really allows them to understand that our food systems are, you know, a community resource um, that we should all recognize and respect, you know, the hard work that it goes to, you know, grow food. Um, and, you know, all of our resources are, you know, designed to kind of meet that, you know, the educator where they need and make sure that, you know, they can be supported through instructional environments. So whether that's, you know, in or out of the classroom, make that integration so much more easy um, and reinforcing learning outside of the classroom. Parents, right, caregivers, they need to be part of that learning process. 
um, in helping their, you know, their children build and reinforce those skills. Um, it shouldn't just be what's happening in, in the classroom or in schools, but reinforcing that at home as well in their home environment. Um, so, you know, supporting the, the education at home and outside is also our top priority. So we offer a variety of, you know, resources um, for, you know, adults and, and families and parents. Um, and one of those resources is kind of our newsletter that's incorporated in our curricula, which helps to kind of reinforce those nutritional concepts that are being taught in school to be shared at home. Our nutrition builders, which are on the left, um, kind of just one page activities. And these are great sort of, you know, um, activities that a parent or maybe a teacher can facilitate that, right? Build that nutrition knowledge and reinforce that healthy eating pattern. In the middle are our wellness prescription pads. And these are kind of, as, as, as it's shared, right? A prescription style kind of a resource available for teens or, or families. And there's kind of a fun way to kind of, you know, encourage or prescribe healthy behaviors. Like maybe it's, you know, increasing your um, vegetable consumption or drinking more water or, um, you know, maybe accessing, you know, breakfast and um, picking up a, a school breakfast in the morning if they're just not, you know, not eating breakfast. Um, and to our right, our community education booklets. So these are great tools that could be distributed resources to either families or, you know, teens themselves as a way to reinforce good nutrition and help them make those, you know, small, take those small steps to um, creating a healthier lifestyle. And in the same sort of vein of the survey um, that was administered to our K to 12 teachers regarding the effectiveness and the likability of our uh, nutrition and resources, we also surveyed how teaching nutrition impacted educators' dietary habits. So, um, you know, teachers reported making positive changes in their food choices. And this really demonstrates how critical it is to model and practice those healthy, you know, healthy behaviors. Health education truly does have an impact. And if we're not putting a value on health, you know, then our students or our kids won't either, right? We have to really practice what we teach um, and demonstrate that and role model that. And the results of these surveys um, showed that that food intake that teachers increased, um, you know, are actually under consumed food groups that most Americans are just not, you know, not meeting their, their, their food consumption requirement. Like, vegetables, um, fruits, and dairy. So this definitely has a had a positive shift in their eating patterns. And um, lastly, the Center for Disease Control recommends 40 to 50 hours of nutrition education a year to create effective behavior change. Like that's, that's amazing when you think, gosh, 40 to 50 hours a year. But the reality is that um, most of our kids receive, you know, less than eight hours of nutrition education a year. And we know that there are so many barriers um, when you're talking about, well, you know, what's the reason? It's, it could be the lack of time, the competing academic priorities. And we can't expect our classroom teachers or, you know, school food service professionals to, you know, to take on that responsibility and be the only ones, um, you know, uh, teaching nutrition education or, or really um, providing those opportunities to have conversations. So to overcome barriers, nutrition ed, needs to be part of a larger systems approach um, as part of that whole school, whole child framework. And you know, we shared how incorporating nutrition with social emotional learning and physical activity are examples of how relatable and important health topics can be integrated to achieve health literacy. And you know, we have to adopt to the changing environment and nutrition education has to evolve and exist in a variety of settings. So this is really where I think our school panel um, is going to be able to kind of touch on, you know, what are they doing and the different sort of settings in which they are able to connect with their with their students um, and their family. So we'd like to um, hear from them. And um, I'd like to introduce first Andrea Guerin, who is the director of health and wellness of Broadwood City School District. And she will be followed by Ann Gaffney, a nutrition specialist from Elk Grove Unified. So Anne, uh, uh, excuse me, Andrea, I hope you are on the line and I will let you take it away. Hi there. Um, my apologies if my, I just noticed my video, the sun is now in my eyes, but so forgive me, but uh, you have the slides to look at, so that's good. Um, anyway, thank you so much for having me today. I, today I really just wanted to talk a little bit about something we did last spring that was very effective and um, it worked with, and so we just wanted to share it today as a way to um, 
just communicate something that worked. Although this year is a bit different than last year because this year we're not in that distance learning mode. Um, anyhow, um, so I just work, I work in Redwood City School District and I'm the Director of Health and Wellness. I, I used to work at the Dairy Council of California, as a matter of fact, years ago. And so um, I've always stayed connected to um, Valerie uh, from the Dairy Council. And we talked a lot last spring about nutrition education and the importance of nutrition education, because really the conversation in, in wellness is, and health has really moved so much towards mental health. And one of the things we talk a lot about is really when we're talking about our total health and well-being, we cannot forget about the importance of nutrition. Um, nutrition is important because it, what, when we eat well, we feel better. Certainly when we're hungry, we can't learn. And also um, it supports mental health. And so it's, we tend, you know, unfortunately, sometimes the focus gets in one, in one direction and we may lose sight of the, the big picture of health and well-being, um, nutrition being one, physical activity being another, et cetera. So anyhow, in that conversation, we did come up with an idea and it was opportunistic. It came out of the Wednesday day that happened to be the asynchronous learning day at our school. It's the day that the teachers did their prep and had to you know, move all their lessons to online. They needed that day. And so students were left with an asynchronous day. And so what we came up with was a way to package the resources that the Dairy Council uh, had um, created with the Cooperative Extension and other partners um, by making videos. Um, and they made these wonderful videos with, with these all these young people, which was very relatable. And I say young, younger than me, that's young. But young people created these videos um, that were very, very, very well produced. And they were all giving the lesson that tied to the Dairy Council workbook. So what was so fantastic about this idea was that we had these very visual engaging um, speakers doing these short, um, as I say, very well produced lessons, but the teacher could also send home materials uh, to a student so that there was an actual like physical connection to the classroom with the, um, days during the week that materials went home to, to families. So it was just a great way to kind of connect and engage with the students. And the videos were um, packaged, as I mentioned, over seven weeks. Um, and here on this slide, you're seeing each week we did, you know, lesson one and had the topic with the videos, the amount of time so that the teacher would know if they were going to assign something exactly how much time it was going to take and then the follow-up workbook activity. Um, so this is how we set it up. And the way we sent it out was we, I worked with the director of ed services who does a newsletter for teachers each week and principals. So she would just have, she would ask me to put in her newsletter, this is this week's Wellness Wednesday activity. And so we left it really up to the, teachers and principals to decide how they wanted to work with that week's activity. Um, some teachers posted it in a Google Classroom. Um, others put it, um, the principals, a lot of them put it in a parent newsletter that went home to parents. And it just really showed that there was this effort to um, engage with the students and give them something tangible, like the workbook. And um, we found that it was just um, really successful. Now, as far as what that looks like um, this year, right? Because now we're back in person. Of course, now we're, everyone's back in person and that's been, mental health is, is still the, the, the number one topic. <laughs> and that really is just because kids needed to readjust to school. But the hope is that by creating this very tight seven week program that we've created some space and allow there to be some conversation about the importance of nutrition and um, its value and tying it to mental health, to tying it to well-being, reminding people that you, when you're taking care of yourself, when you're taking care of your body, you're taking care of your mind as well. And this year, I'm really excited and encouraged by the health, health education framework because 
I think that um, it's an important step in the right direction to really remember that holistically, we don't want to forget about nutrition. Nutrition is more than food service. It's more than what the kids are served at school. It's teaching kids how to take care of themselves. And it's um, emotional for most people, eating and being fed, et cetera. Food security is also important. So we always want to be sensitive to the needs of hungry students and make sure that we're we have resources for them. But that doesn't mean we can't teach the what and the why of, of nutrition. So that's my plug for um, this Wellness Wednesday program that we put together. It worked effectively. It was a great partnership. And as you can see on this slide, it was really a partnership between principals and teachers and parents and students and our um, ed services um, superintendent as well. So anyway, that's our success story. And um, I'm sure that those resources are available um, through partnership. Again, I mentioned I work with Valerie Fungling at the Dairy Council, Bailey Rose was the other um, contact that I worked with. And so just tremendously helpful um, in providing the resources to us for the program. So that's, that's my story. Thank you. Very good. And I'll jump in from there. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ann Gaffney. I'm the registered dietitian and school nutrition specialist with Elk Grove Unified School District. And I'm really excited to share our nutrition education program for, uh, with you. So what Andrea was just sharing was more like a district level program. And this is the program that is brought um, to our students through food nutrition services. So before I get started, I wanna give you a quick overview of our school district. If you wanna go ahead and advance, there we go. So um, Elk Grove Unified is a very diverse school district with um, just over 63,000 students and we have 67 schools. Go to the next one. There we go. Uh, food and Nutrition provides breakfast and lunch at all 67 sites in our district. And I'm in an average year, which of course we haven't seen that for just a bit here. Um, uh, we provide about 8.5 million meals. So our food nutrition, go ahead, next one. Thanks. Our Food Nutrition Services Department operates a nutrition education program under the name of SHAPE, which stands for Shaping Health as Partners in Education. This is a volunteer program that provides nutrition education resources to teachers. Um, currently, we have about 552 SHAPE teachers, and teachers join SHAPE by attending an orientation that covers basic nutrition and nutrition education resources. And then they renew their membership annually by attending an in-service. Now, the in-service is offered on multiple days to give the opportunity for attendance. They're about an hour and a half long, and they're held after the school day. So again, attending is optional, it's voluntary, and they're not paid to attend, but teachers do receive professional growth credit for attending. Go to the next one. Um, at the workshops, we cover um, food nutrition services, information and changes, what's happening in the world of food service type of information, um, a current nutrition theme, and then also nutrition education resources. And then after the workshop, we send um, the sign-in sheet to the Dairy Council of California and the curriculum or consumable pieces are sent directly to the teacher's school site. Uh, we also distribute Ag in the Classroom materials and the USDA's MyPlate curriculum is given out at, at the orientation. Now you're thinking all these materials, well, they're free. So of course teachers really could get them on their own, um, but they might not be aware of them. And we also just make it really convenient for them to get. Uh, to help combat that argument that teachers are too busy to teach nutrition, we have worked to incorporate nutrition into what they're already teaching. The district's curriculum department has been a great partner for us. Uh, for example, they went through the newly adopted uh, language arts curriculum, Wonders, um, and provided information and resources for teachers and write, um, for research and writing projects that all centered on nutrition. Okay, there we go. Another resource that we provide as part of our nutrition education program is Harvest of the Month. Um, I'm sure you've heard it from other school districts and everybody does it just a little bit different. Uh, the way we do it is we distribute produce for taste testing and studying to approximately 800 classrooms a month. Um, to help market our Harvest of the Month program, we hold a National Nutrition Month poster contest each March, uh, focusing on the produce for the next year's Harvest of the Month. The student's artwork is used to produce a calendar and a poster that's given to each teacher. Uh, we also provide a class set 
of grade specific workbooks that corresponds with that year's harvest of the month. A very popular draw to our nutrition education program is grade specific related field trips. Um, um, I've added a number of classrooms um, and students to typically participate um, to give you an idea of the reach so you can see those in the slides there. But for first and third grade classes, they visit the central kitchen for a tour, a taste testing activity, and um, a, a, they get to do a shape nutrition lesson with our shape -a mascot. For second grade, Second grade has a school site tour and taste test lesson right at their school site. They can get to see the kitchen and there you see the kids in one of the walk-in refrigerators. It's thrilling for them, it's very cute. It also gives a chance for our food service staff to inter intermix with the kids on a different level. Um, for fourth grade, um, they visit a local farm and um, or they go to the local farmer's market. For fifth graders, we practice label reading in a local grocery store. And sixth grade has a tour and nutrition lesson at the local food bank. Okay. We also provide cooking assemblies for sixth grade students. So here you can see an example of one of the cooking lessons happening where all the kids are doing their, working their own station for cutting up fruits and vegetables. Okay, so although the food trips are currently on hold, during, due, to, during, because, due to the pandemic, nutrition education continues. So next month, tomorrow, uh, we're gonna start our celebration of National School Lunch Week and Farm to School Month by highlighting where produce um, is um, grown, the produce is grown that's served in the cafeteria and by giving resources to teachers um, to use produce taste in the cafeteria for their harvest of the month lessons in the classroom instead of sending it directly to the classroom. Um, my next slide, and I just like to leave you with the same thing I always say at every one of my teacher workshops is that thank you for making nutrition a priority in your classroom because it really makes a difference. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anne and Andrea, for just, you know, sharing these wonderful models of programming that are, you know, that are effective, that are sustainable, and that, you know, we can all learn from and just be inspired to adopt these new strategies and ideas, um, you know, either in the districts that we serve or maybe the, the districts that we, um, you know, support, um, like myself as a, you know, community, um, community leader. But before, you um, I, I'm hoping uh, NECA Health Education Council is, um, is with us here on the line to help us kind of with our breakout session activity. We really would like us to kind of break out into groups, have um, you know, some time to kind of connect and share a little bit about you know, what we're doing um, to support and advance um, student wellness. So if you don't wanna share just you know, some, some example, um, and, you know, from what was shared today, um, you know, what did you learn? What inspired you, you know, and why? And, you know, what kind of challenges are you facing or may you face if, you know, you're trying to think about, oh, well, I could possibly, um, you know, create this sort of, you know, change in maybe the program that I'm offering or um, integrate a new strategy. What systems of support may you need and, you know, what will that look like? So um, I would love for us to kind of break out into groups based on maybe our um, sort of representation or a title. So if you are a school nurse or an administrator, um, we'll have Andrea Guerin from Redwood City sort of facilitate that breakout room. Uh, Anne Gaffney uh, will be facilitating the schools, the elementary group. Janice Price will be facilitating the middle and high. And if you're a, a community member, um, myself with Dairy Council, I'll be facilitating that. So NECA, I'm hoping that you can um, sort of walk the participants today to how to sort of select that, but it'll be self-selection. So um, NECA, I will let you sort of control that. <laughs> Thank you for the assistance. Yes, um, so we will have um, everyone go in the break rooms based on um, the uh, the different um, positions, as I put in the chat, um, there should be um, a selection pop up on your screen. Please let me know if you do um, see that. Give me heads, uh, hands up or something like that. 
seeing anything on my end. Is anyone else seeing? I did see something pop up and it just distracted me. So I closed okay. out of it. I apologize if maybe that was what I was looking for, but it didn't look mm. like it was, there were tiles where I could select. And we apologize everyone for um, the difficulties. You are welcome to, um, you know, if you have questions maybe for our school panelists, they are here to answer any questions you may have. Um, we most certainly want to um, make you know uh, good use of both Andrea and Anne's presence in this um, in this session. So I welcome you to either you know submit a question in the chat box or if you would like to unmute yourself. Um, thank you, Nyeka. I do I do see the. Um, yeah, do you the, see it now? Yes, I do. Thank okay, you. awesome. Okay, and if you are having difficulty, please um, put, to let us know in the chat, and then um, uh, Hannah would be able to um, put you in that room, specific room. Okay, thank you so much. that we were having, I, I know we're um, a little bit uh, behind time, but if there are just key takeaways, um, anything that anyone would like to, to share, please, um, I, you know, invite you to um, unmute yourself um, and, you know, just highlight a little bit of, you know, what was discussed. Certainly in my group, we had uh, in the community, um, you members group, there was just a lot of good conversation and, and um, you know, connectivity to, how we can really take this information that was learned, especially, you know, the connectivity of, you know, social emotional learning, nutrition, and, you know, within that health umbrella, um, how can we make sure that's really well integrated into the work that we're doing? Um, so I want to thank Leslie for, for her, um, her contributions to that discussion. Um, and, you know, April as well, who uh, really is kind of, you know, spearheading and steering the work at her local, um, you know, uh, food bank and food resource center, we were just, you know, talking about the reality is we, you know, sometimes we are in the thick of, you know, thick of the messy metal and um, kind of in survival mode right now. We're still most certainly recovering from, you know, from the pandemic. Um, that's, you know, it's still affecting a lot of individuals in our community. So how can we continue to keep that at the center and at the forefront in, you know, in the conversations that we have um, and be a little bit more, um, you know, open and, and realistic to uh, to what we could possibly do at the time. So um, I just want to thank everyone in the group um, for your, your contributions, but I'm not sure if anyone else from the other groups would like to kind of just uh, quickly recap maybe some of the conversations that they had um, just really, really briefly before we advance.
So, Sonia, I'd share from the um, from the schools group. Um, we sort of talked about how challenging it's been to change up with with COVID going on, um, but there's been some real creative things. Harvest of the month being taught in preschool classes and interns teaching um, by Zoom in elementary schools. So there's been some real creativity that's come out of all this. Awesome, wonderful to hear. Um, uh, we will go ahead and um, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you, Anne, for just uh, sh uh, sharing. Um, I wish we had more time, darn. <laughs> Uh, but let's go ahead and um, move forward. So uh, with, you know, just the Let's Eat Healthy movement, as I shared, this really was, you know, propelled and launched to really help us do much more in partnerships um, and really activate our cause. So I um, certainly invite you to join the websites on their healthyeating.org or excuse me, uh, backslash join where you can, you know, connect with us, get um, the latest, you know, nutrition research and information and resources um, and learn a little bit more of ways that we can create you know, a partnership uh, to better support the work that you're doing out in, the, in your communities and those that you serve. So we'd like to launch a really quick poll. Um, Nick, I'm hoping you can help me with that. Yes, um, and here. thank you so much. And uh, the poll, so, um, you know, with Dairy Council's Let's Eat Healthy movement, you know, what can you do leaving today? Do you maybe want to learn more about nutrition equity, right? What does this mean? What does this entail? Do you want to teach, right? I'm ready to start teaching healthy eating to others, um, whether that's, you know, your youth, your, um, your colleagues, uh, get them connected with resources, uh, parents, Whatever, whoever that may be, maybe you want to advocate for the access of nutritious foods for, you know, everyone in your community, um, or maybe you're ready to, you know, collaborate, start to have those conversations with your, um, you know, with your, with your peers. So, um, we'll give this just a, a couple more seconds. We're at 75%. So I'm hoping we can get to uh, close to hundred. <laughs> Okay, well, we can um, stop the poll there. We're at 87%. So um, thank you so much. Um, so, it, you know, we definitely have, you know, a blend. Um, I'm hoping you guys could see the results, right? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, you know, we have a, a blend, right? A lot of us are here in the room. We are ready to collaborate. We're ready to connect with one another and have conversations and, um, you know, get, get the ball rolling, as they say. So thank you so much. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, any questions you may have, um, but I certainly want to share again our contact information and we are here to, you know, support you, all of us. Dairy Council certainly wants to support that work, the work that you're doing. So please connect with us, um, whatever those needs may be. And if, you know, um, we can't, you know, meet, meet your needs, we can certainly connect you with someone else that um, could support you. So um, I know our, our um, panelists here will lend themselves as well to um, provide any technical assistance and advising. Um, so we are, we are here to, to support your work. So please connect with us. And um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and you can open up the floor for any questions. Were there any questions in the chat? I'm not, um, I'm not seeing. I um... don't see any. Oh, I have a question. Um, I know Sonia, you talked about the triennial assessment template for the wellness policy. Um, could you, do you have more information on that or could you share a little bit more about what that template is like? Is that, would, um, is that something districts could complete or would it be completed by school sites or both? Um, yeah, I'd love to learn more about that. Absolutely, great question, Marissa. Yeah, so the templates, um, those districts would want to access or maybe anyone if a community member is supporting the, the compliance process of it. So right, the documentation. So that's really what, where the templates come into play to kind of capture um, what everyone is doing, and, but also be able to support with, um, you know, action planning and goal setting and be able to identify where are their opportunities and kind of weaknesses within those areas of implementation or even uh, within the, um, the language itself of the policy as you're trying to, you know, assess and revise that um, and survey as well. So I can, 
try to drop the, the link in the chat um, to help everyone kind of right, directly connect uh, to, those, to those resources. But if there's anyone else here in the room that has that might have used them, please feel free to um, share your expertise. Um, so I will go ahead and drop that. But there is also an, another resource that I can share, which I can add to um, the resource guide. There was a, a webinar that was um, um, done, I wanna say a couple of weeks ago by the California um, State Collaborative, uh, the Local School Wellness Policy Collaborative that touched a little bit about the triennial assessment and um, shared a little bit more information about the, the template as well. So I could share that link to that recording as well. So if individuals here in the room are interested um, in learning more about that, then they can um, access that in CDE, um, is part of that presentation as well. So they, de they definitely address a lot of great questions that some of our school partners or maybe community partners may have today. So and Sonia, Sonia, there will be another webinar on October 19th that is directed towards schools about the triennial assessment. I, I have okay. been working on that as part of the collaborative. I can forward to you um, uh, what information that I have and then you can forward it out. Yes, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, One, I'm so glad we have yes you in the room uh, to be able to you know shed light and um, add a little bit of that perspective to right what the collaborative has you know has planned. Um, so thank you so much. That would be really it's, helpful. it's available on your website. On it's available on the Dairy Council website. Yes. Thank you so Just much. Put it, Sonia, I put it in the chat as well. The webinar Thank you so much. October 9th at one, and then there's a registration link from UC Davis Zoom .us. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Thank yes. you. I think in the heat of the moment, you kind of write the lapse of it, you kind of forget what's <laughs> the dates. And so thank you so much. I appreciate for the uh, the assistance there. <laughs> Hi, we also have um, a question in the chat from Judy Huffaker. Um, how the question is, how were you supporting the program costs for harvest of the month and the nutrition education field trips pre-COVID? Okay, so um, for harvest of the month, we applied to California Department of Education, let them know what our nutrition education plan is, and you submit a budget with that as well. And then once we got approval, then we're actually using cafeteria funds to pay for harvest of the month. And we were able to get approval to not only purchase the produce, but also to print the calendars, the workbooks, everything that went along with harvest of the month. So that's how we did that one. Um, you can't pay for buses with cafeteria funds. So that comes out of our general fund for you know the school district. And Anne, don't you just have to say that you're gonna serve whatever highlighted food that is on your line like that month or something? Um, we do say that we're gonna that we're gonna have it out on the on the line because usually we almost all the time as we are, um, but you have to really show how is it going to affect your participation. So you know, we're doing these great services for the classroom and the teacher. So then the teachers are encouraging their students to eat school meals and to make healthy choices. Awesome. Great question. Great. Thank you so much, Judy, for that great question. Question and thank you, Anne, for the answer. Um, so, does anyone have any other questions um, at the moment? Okay. Well, I see that there are no questions. Um, uh, so we would like to thank Sonia Fernandez, Arana, Janice Price, and Gaffney, Andrea Guerin, and everyone else who was able to join us today um, for this session. As a reminder, if you need professional development credits for today's session, please complete the post survey, which is linked in the chat. And um, it also will be sent through an email after the session. All some attendees can also enter our gift card raffle by filling out the post session survey. Also remember to join us tomorrow at 3.30 for the session on professional development, educator wellness, and social and emotional well, um, emotional learning, sorry. Um, and also if you have any other questions, um, anything comes up, I will make sure to put my 
um, information in the chat and um, I will direct you to the best person to contact. Um, so yeah, if no one else had any other questions at the moment, um, I hope every we have four more minutes. So you have four more minutes of your time. Um, but yeah, if um, no one else has any questions, um, I hope you all have a good evening and I will make sure to put my information in the chat if anyone else has any questions later on. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Good evening.